uh, you know, make French onion soup like yeah. a motherfucker. <laughs> Probably had the best staff meal, though. Uh, but, <laughs> so, you know, I was kind of the last cook in the door, and then it was like I kind of just, you know, people kept quitting, and I kept, like, working Stepping through the line. Up. And I was like, hey, I can cook here. I can cook yeah. on this level, you know and I mean? And I think, you know, eventually, you know, I worked for Tony Matuano eventually, and I remember he told me at one point, you know, the 35th anniversary of Spiaggia. I was like, you know, it's just wild, 35 years. And he goes, yeah, he's like, you realize so much of this business is just, you know, perseverance. Yeah. He's like, and if you're still around, he goes, even if, you know, he goes, you know, he goes, I know I get considered one of the best chefs in Chicago. And he goes, and it might just be because there's no one around anymore to dispute that fact. <laughs> like, he's like, he's like, I'm kind of just here. He's like, so, he's like, the other three people who are still here doing it from when we started, yeah. like, you know, they're going to be like, yeah, sure, that guy's awesome. I'm awesome. Like, we're the three best. You know what I mean? He's like, because who else is there to say otherwise? Yeah. And, you know, that's like wild. And I think that's, you know, why the only reason I made it through Table 52 and Girl the Go is I just kept coming back every mm-hmm. day. And then eventually, you know, Steph made me a sous chef there, and that was, you know, incredible. That's a, it's a big day. And that was, yeah, and I'm like, you know, it was a huge. Like, you get I knighted. Was, yeah. Call I your parents. Me. You're like, I'm a sous chef. They're like, what is that? Right. Yeah, I think that was when my dad finally stopped asking me when yeah. I was going to go back to college. Okay. And then asking me when I was going to get a real degree. Yeah. Um, so, you know, six years in my cooking career. and um, But that was, you know, incredible. That place, you know. And that place was just so formative because it was, you know, the antithesis of anything else. It was, you know, Stephanie didn't want to be called chef. It wasn't, you know, about, like, it was just about the food. And she was just, like, it felt like everybody else was so doing this, like, strict, tight, fucking fine dining shit. Mm -hmm. Steph just felt like, it felt like fucking, like, so fucking punk rock or something. Yeah. You know what I mean? It just was, like... It felt like we didn't, you know, like she didn't, like she cared so much and she worked so hard and she works harder than anyone I've ever met or worked with. But like, it just felt like we had such a didn't give a fuck attitude about it that it just felt so much fucking cooler than anything. You know what I mean? And we were busier than everybody. And you know, it was a time where restaurants were closing like crazy and there was nothing over here in the West Loop. And she put it there and people were like, why the fuck is she going over there? That's crazy. And it was just like, you know, fucking rejuvenated this neighborhood. And then all of a sudden, everybody wanted to be in the West Loop. Because yeah. they thought that was like the secret to her success was that she was over here. And it was like, no, she's just, she's a fucking just monster. Good food, dude. dude. She cooks lights <laughs> yeah. out. And she was doing, you know, you know, vivid, like, you know, you have those vivid flavor memories. I just remember of dishes there, like, tasting them. And I was just like, where you, like, taste things and you see technique where you realize where you're really at in your career. And you're like, holy shit, I'm not anywhere close to this. Yeah. Like, you know, you, like, thought, like, you're like, oh, well, I cook good food and, like, make, the, you know, and things and dishes I've made. And I was like, I'm fucking... I'm not worthy. I was like, I'm not even in the same realm. Like, this yeah. lady's cooking in a different stratosphere than me. Like, I have so much work to do. Mm-hmm. And that was, like, the first thing I thought when, I'm, you know, tasting stuff. food. I was like, I have so much work to do to get, if I, you know, and, like... That realization of, like, your competition isn't the other cooks on the line. Your competition, you know, when you get there, it's going to be those other chefs. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, and, and not, you know, competition in a bad way, but of, like, how you're going to be measured and how you're going to be successful. Like, you know, if you want to open a restaurant in the same neighborhood as them, like, you know, people are going to compare you. And it's like, you know where the bar is, right? You know what the level is. And I think, you know, that was one of the reasons, really, that I ended up leaving there. Because yeah. I was like... I'm not good enough to just stay here and run this. I don't know enough yet. Gotcha. I can't contribute. You know what I mean? I have so much more to learn. And that's why after t- two years I left there um, because I felt like I was on a track where, you know, it was going really well and I knew Steph stuff well and I knew, you know, how to run things at the GOAT. And yeah. Need Steph. Like, I, I love Steph. She's still an incredible friend of mine. She's, you know, a mentor. Uh, and, you know, that was, you know, one of my, you know, favorite jobs I ever had. I loved working there. Uh, but it was just like, it was like that thing in the back of your head where you're like, you got to keep going because if you stay here, you're going to get really good at all this, but there's a bunch of other shit you need to learn. Yeah. So that's kind of what kicked me out the door there for myself was, I was like, you know, she was going to open her second restaurant. She wanted me to move over there, move into a bigger role. And I realized like, I'm not ready for that. Yeah. And I need to stay learning. So I left there and I went and opened, uh, I really, you know, we had cooked like. 
Steph used, you know, introduced me to, I've never seen it, you know, really any Korean ingredients. Besides, okay. Besides, you know, like, uh, like in friends' houses growing up, like a little bit, you know, um, but like not in a professional kitchen whatsoever. So um, Steph introduced me to that. That was the first time I'd gone to the Korean market, gone up to Junbu here and like, you know, seen like fresh kimchi and gochugang and haichandel and all that stuff. And it kind of, I was like, this is really cool. I'd like to know more about this. So, you know, kind of at that time, if you wanted to cook Asian food in Chicago, there was, you know, you went and worked for either, you know, Takashi or Jin Kato or Bill Kim were really, you know, the biggest three names mm-hmm. in that kind of market here. So Bill Kim was opening a new restaurant in the West Loop. So um, I called Bill and I said, you know, I know you need a sous chef. I'd like to be your sous chef. And, you know, I went and opened uh, Belly Q and Urban Belly with him and spent two years uh, working with him. Heard. Um which was, you know, awesome. And I was like, you know, I spent, you know, I was at the Korean market twice a week. I was at the Thai market once a week. I was at the Vietnamese market once a week. And I learned a ton about that food and, you know, fell in love with it. And it weirdly, at the end of it, I was like, okay, cool. It's awesome. I did this. Now I need to go cook Italian food. And I don't even really know <laughs> how that became that. But, you know, um, you know, I was still a sous chef. This was, you know, my second sous chef job at the time. And then... I, there was a new restaurant opening. I applied to be the sous chef at it. I did a tasting. It was the first tasting I ever done. It went well. Interview went well. And then at the end, 11th hour, I didn't get it. I was like fucking bummed. I was like, man, where do I go cook Italian food? And I remember I asked my the, the guy who's the exec sous there. Um, I said, where do I go cook Italian food? He's like, well, you know, he's like, unless you're going to move to New York, he's like, you have to go work at Spiaggia. He's like, it's the only place in Chicago if you're really going to do Italian food right. He's like, and you need to learn it. He's like, you need to learn that touch, that lightness. And um, so I just waited, and then one day, sous chef job popped off at Spiaggia. And so I went and applied, and I met Tony, and we talked for a while. And I remember he asked me, um, the last question in the interview for me was, he goes, you know, he goes, why would I hire you to be my sous chef of an Italian restaurant? He goes, you've never cooked Italian food in your life. Because I think it's one of those weird things. The people who do Italian food have mostly only done Italian food, mm-hmm. right? Usually, if you're if you get in that line, you just do Italian food forever. And I think that happens a lot in this industry, where people, you know, you find your one thing, and you, you know, you always work at that type of restaurant for some yeah. reason. And especially for Italian food, that seems uh, weirdly true. Um, and uh, he goes, "Why would I hire you?" to be a sous chef here. You've never cooked this food before professionally. You know, you've just been cooking Korean food for the last two years. Yeah. Like, you know, he's like, you've never worked at a Michelin star restaurant and now you want to, you know, manage an Italian Michelin star restaurant. And, you know, I told him, I said, I was like, yeah, you're right. You know, I was like, but I go, I'll work harder than anybody. And I go, you know, you know who I worked for. I was like, you can call them. They'll tell you. Like, I'm like, I'll put in, you know, more work than anybody yet and I will, you know, I'll do this right for you. And so he bought in on it, luckily, and gave me the job. So I ended up over there. And um, I remember, like, you know, it was kind of a nerve-wracking move because this was now my third sous chef job in a row. Yeah. I hadn't climbed the ranks at all. I had made two linear moves. And I remember my chef at the time giving me shit about making moves. Like, oh, you're making another linear move? And I was like... It's like, yeah, but it's the job I want. And, you know, I had, you know, you, I, it's hard not to look around in this, I guess, in anything, right? Yeah. But, you know, those peers you came up with. And you're Where all the same now? age, and now they're starting they to move into. They have a Michelin star, and I don't. They're, they're moving shit. into, you know, exec sous roles. Yeah. And CDC roles, and I'm still a sous chef, right? After, you know, this is my third sous chef job, and they're, you know, oh, you know, number two at this place, and their name's being put on the menu, and they're putting up dishes, and I'm like, ooh, like, you know. You're kind of like, I think you have those moments of, like, am I getting left behind? Yeah. Uh, but, well, you know. not I'm, successful enough. Right. You know what I mean? And it's, but I think it just, you know, it goes to show there's, there's no pace but your own, right? Yeah. Like, and, you know, I was a line cook for a long time, too. I was a line cook for five years, which now it seems like, you know, no one is a line cook for five no. years. <laughs> um, no and, one graduates too early. Right, and you know, and I was a sous chef for five years, and it was, you know, but that's what I needed, like, for me to get, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? And so, I was there, my first year there, 
the, there was a new exec chef, and he ended up leaving after his first year. And I went to Tony, and I said, I want to be, I want to be chef here. Got you. And I'd never been an executive sous chef. I'd never been a chef de cuisine. I'd only been a sous chef. I'd never worked at a Michelin star restaurant except Spiaggio. What was his reaction? And I said, I want this. Yeah. I said, give me a shot. And he was like, okay. He was like, I'm like, I'm like, Tone, like, you know, he had seen the work I'd done for a yeah. year. I said, and I kind of laid out a plan. I said, this is what I want to do. These are my goals. I said, you know, and this is, um, you know, my goals for the restaurant. And I want you to tell me what yours are and let's see if we can get that. Yeah. And he was like, all right. You know, like, like no one's ever said that to like, me before. Crazy motherfucker. Right. Yeah. Like, um, <laughs> so I took the wheel and, you know, that first year was fucking hard. Oh, yeah. All those guys you were peers with, now you have to manage them. You know, and that even wasn't that there. That was never the issue. Okay. It was of just more understanding that there's what you... Taking over something that's been around for 33 years at that point. Yeah. That's iconic. That's, you know, there's an expectation of what it is. Um, It's extremely difficult and, you know... Because, you know, I'm thrown into a lineage of chefs that includes, you know, Missy Robbins and Sarah Grunberg in the last 10 years. <laughs> and then me. Yeah. And it's like, fuck. <laughs> like, you know, you're like, so it's like, you know, like, okay, so I'm compared. So everyone's going to walk in here in the door. And they've, they've eaten here before. They've eaten here from one of two James Beard Award winners. Yeah. You know, so it's like, they're pretty good at this. Um, and... That was massive, and that was nerve-wracking for me, and, like, this pressure of, like, oh, my God, what if, what if I'm the one who loses the Michelin star? You know, what if I'm the one who closes this restaurant after 33 years? Like, that, that pressure was way more immense than me than worrying about, you know, my peers and people around me, and I was like, you know, um, I think I was better at that end of it than, than, you know, other parts. But, you know, that first year was tough of realizing that, you know, you can do whatever you want to do, but you've got to also give the people somewhat of what they want. Yeah. You know, when there's yep. an expectation. They want this restaurant to be what it was for mm-hmm. them, and you can't fuck with that too much. Yeah. You can do what you want to do, but you have to, you know what I mean? You, you, you have to meet it. them halfway. Yeah. Um, and I learned that lesson the hard way early on, and I remember, you know, like, fucking people, like, people, like, fucking yelling at me. Oh, yeah. Like, yelling at this me. This is not what it used to be. Right. You know, like, <laughs> and, you know, like, getting my, it was crazy, and I was like, holy shit, like, I'm going to run this place on the ground. Yeah. But, you know, luckily, you know, Tony... Um, always supported me, and he was always, you know, hey, like, you know, you're doing good. Like, just, you know, I believe in what you're doing, and, you know, what you're doing makes sense. Just, like, keep with it. Mm-hmm. And so we kept with it. We got better at it, you know. Um, more and more people bought into kind of the culture we were selling. Yeah. Um, and this idea that we were doing fine dining, and it was going to be technique-driven, and that we were going to do, you know, and it wasn't going to be this crazy, screamy fine dining kitchen. Like, this was going to be a fun place to work, even though it was going to be Michelin star. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I think the first year I kept the star, and I was like, okay, you know, the food's where it needs to be, but let's see if we can make the culture what we want it. Yeah. And then we started working on that. And then, you know, when we did that, and we got that right, and then we kept the star again, it was like, we can make this more fun. Yeah. We can make this better. And I think we got better and better at that. And so it was... It made it a really, really special place where it's like, you know, you almost had to explain to people who came in, like, hey, this is, like, I know this is like a fine dining restaurant, but it's like, if you want, you know what I mean, like, tweezer tongue, makeshift float, fucking powder, whatever, like, this ain't it. This ain't it, yeah. You know what I mean? If you're on that new cutting edge, like, cool. God bless. Go do it. That It's not me. You know what I mean? I'm like, I'm not, the, there's some people out there who are artists, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? They're, they're revolutionary. It's like, I am a guy who makes dinner. Yeah. <laughs> I make supper. Right. I'm like, I'm like, we're making fucking dinner. Yeah. Every night. That's what we do. We make fucking dinner. <laughs> and like, if that's, you want to come make dinner with us? Yeah. Come make dinner with us. It's fun. And we're going to use great ingredients. And we're going to be super technique driven. And if you come here, you're going to know how to butcher whole fish. You're going to know how to butcher whole animals. You're going to know sauce work. Like, you're going to know everything. But, you know what I mean? Like, you know. And if I don't know how to do it, I'll try to find somebody who does. Yeah. And so we did a lot of cool things in that realm where we had people, you know, we had a really cool whole animal program where, you know, if we got a new whole animal and I didn't know how to, you know, we got venison. I didn't know how to butcher a deer. Like, you know, I grow up deer hunting on the south side. Like, um, so 
we had, you know, a local butcher, this guy Rob Levitt, who runs Public and Quality Meats now. I yeah. said, hey, can I order a deer to your butcher shop? And we'll come in after hours.